All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is U-R-L-E-Y, and he was involved in a very important event, at least in my personal life, but also in American history, and that was the death of Vince Foster that took place in on July 20th, 1993. He's also mentioned many times in a book uh, that has just come out. The title of that book is The Murder of Vince Foster, America's Would-Be Dreyfus Affair written by David Martin, and I had Dave Martin on earlier. He and I uh, discussed one of his earlier books, and so this book has just come out, um, and he, I, I'm familiar with DC Dave because he was a voluminous kind of article writer about the Vince Foster affair. So when I was in DC from 1995 to 1998, I was very familiar with that. I lived in Northern Virginia fairly close to where Fort Marcy Park is, which is where they found the body of uh, Vince Foster. So uh, Mr. Turley also is friends with David Martin and was also kind of a citizen journalist and very much involved in this whole story. So he's going to share his perspective and how he got involved with the death of Vince Foster and just kind of tell, tell the whole story from his perspective. So Mr. Turley, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, William. Thank you. Thanks for uh, agreeing to the interview. So for people who may not have known you or not familiar with the story of Vince Foster, can you tell people about your background and uh, what happened to Vince Foster and how you got involved in the story? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I, 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 got a, I got interested in it the, the, the day after Mr. Foster died. Vincent Foster was the deputy White House counsel in the Clinton administration, and he was found dead in a park on July 20th, 1993. And the next morning in the newspaper, uh, I was reading at that time the Washington Times, and it reported that his body was found at this park by an anonymous passerby. And that puzzled me because I thought, well, that's that's an important person. I mean, if the body was found by someone, they're a witness because that person saw the scene. And I thought the authorities would certainly want to interview that person and see if they saw anything, if they're going to investigate this death. Uh, and it just didn't make sense to me that they, the person who found the body could be anonymous. I thought, that's very strange. And I said that to my wife at the time, but then I just forgot about it. I mean, that I moved on, and I'm a professional magician uh, professionally, so I deceive people for a living. I, I joke about it sometimes. I say that I, like a lot of people in Washington, I deceive people for a living. But the difference is I tell you before I deceive you that I'm going to lie to you because I'm a magician. So that you know I'm deceiving you, but... Uh, about a year later, after this death, I, I was in uh, Northern Virginia performing, and I was on my way home. I'm in my tuxedo, and uh, I was driving by this park where Foster's body was found. And on the radio at the time, uh, they were broadcasting all the news about O.J. Simpson and the O.J. Simpson murders of uh, his wife, Nicole. And they talked about the people that found the bodies, and they talked about the bloody glove and the car and the white Ford Bronco and all these things. And I thought, well, they, all this information on the radio, and no matter what station you picked, you were going to hear about OJ. I thought, well, this isn't this isn't uh, something I'm in that interested in. I, I wondered what happened to that guy Foster. So I stopped and I walked into the park. Uh, I was nearby, so I went in to take a look around just to see what it looked like, the place. And, and I bumped into a, a gentleman named Reed Irvine, who was the chairman of Accuracy and Media at the time, and he was at the park investigating the death of a Foster. And we met, and uh, he invited me to come to his office the next day where he gave me some documents that I could read, the Park Police report and some other things. And I, then he invited me to come to a, a forum that he was going to have at the Army-Navy Club. And he said there's going to be a guy, Dave Martin, was going to be there, and uh, another journalist, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, and some other people. So I went down, and I was curious. And <laughs> that's when I first met David Martin. And I, I still remember a, a poem that I memorized. That there was a, he writes a lot of poetry, but he, he recited a poem that day. And a lot of people, uh, after this is a year after Foster's death, a lot of people were, were saying, leave the family alone. You know, think of the poor family. You, you know, you're bringing up all these questions about his death. And I, I remember the poem was called Solicitude. It goes like this. Don't you think the family has suffered enough? Why must you stir up this mess? He wasn't constructed of very strong stuff. He couldn't put up with the press. He must not have been what he seemed to be. He could not have been very stable. 
that he might have been killed for his honesty is just a romantic fable. We'll fight for his right to be off in the head. What do you mean we offend you? If you should turn up mysteriously dead, this is how we would defend you. And uh, that's that was my introduction to David Martin. And uh, I think the next day he sent me a fax with some more poetry on it. And uh, and then we just we've been friends ever since. And then, 25 you know, years later, right? 25 years after the event. Yeah. Yeah. But my journey along the way, uh, he and I uh, intersected a lot and, and talked to each other a lot and compared notes. And uh, we became friends uh, around this this mystery mysterious death of Vince Foster. Right. And so for people who don't know the story of Vince Foster, can you give kind of a elementary intro to the story of Vince Foster and how what happened at Fort, Fort Marcy Park and describe the park as well? Well, the park is is a, is a very uh, odd place. It's it's between two rather busy thoroughfares. It has a very small parking lot for about 20 cars. It's kind of curved shaped parking lot. And it's a Civil War fort, but it's, there's really no fort there. There's no real structure. It was what's called an earthen berm fort. And in those days, the soldiers would clear this land out uh, around the, the, that place, and they'd build up earth, you know, and I, so there was like a hill, and they were on the top of the hill with cannon. And there was a circle of forts around Washington, and Fort Marcy Park was one of the forts in the circle of forts. There were probably about 20 of them, I guess, but they were all around the, the city. And this one sort of guarded a bridge called Chain Bridge, which was down the road across the Potomac. But there was a bridge there at the time. Uh, there was never any action at Fort Marcy Park, but uh, it's very close to the CIA headquarters, which is interesting. It's, it's just about a half mile away. And when you go there, it's an eerie place because there's no one there. It's it's always empty. And if there's people there, they're usually people that are up to probably things they shouldn't be doing, like on the day of Foster's death, there was a, uh, a couple there that was married, but they weren't married to each other. And they were in the woods and doing their thing. And so there's, there's people like that might be in the park, but there's there's nothing to see there, really. There's, uh, where there were two artifacts from the Civil War. There were two cannon that were there. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty desolate place. And, yeah, and it's not like a park like you would expect a park with playgrounds or things to do no. or pool. There's nothing. It's just a historical relic. Right. That... There were a couple of picnic tables, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. But it's, but I... it's, uh, it's eerie. I mean, I, when I've been there, uh, and I've been there a lot. It's, sometimes it's scary, actually, because, because it's so desolate and there's no one there. You're kind of vulnerable. I mean, if someone wanted to rob you uh, or mug you, you, know, the, you, you can't call for help because there's nobody around. It's, it's it's that kind of a place. It's just it's, it's not a, not a lot. There's no joggers coming through or picnickers. It's it's pretty uh, it's strange. I, and I you know I think when Foster went there and I don't know how exactly how he got there. His car wasn't there, but he was he was there uh, and uh, died there. Uh, there's stories that the body was moved there, but the forensic evidence shows that he actually died right there. The blood evidence and so on. But his car wasn't there, so he didn't drive himself there. Somebody brought him there and killed. They killed him there. Whoever killed him, we don't know who killed him. But, but it was, uh, uh, you know, it's it's the kind of place where you might meet somebody clandestinely or something. If you if you right. want to be seen, you know, you don't want to meet somebody in private. Let's meet. Let's meet here, and nobody will know we're meeting. Kind of well, place. Right. If it's like a place for a spy drop or Robert Hansen picking up a spy drop. It reminded me of that. But also where he was found. His body was on the side of one of these berms, and it was far into the park. It was at least yeah, was way up a hill. You had to walk about it was about seven hundred yards up to the up to where he was. It's a good hike. Yeah, it's a good hike, and it's in a, he was in a strange place. So, how did some pass, quote passerby casually spot him? You would have had to have been within ten or fifteen feet of where his body was found to see him. Right. So it's well, very, that's, that story is strange right off the bat. Yeah. Well, that was the story that got me interested was who who found the body, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that because I, I, I kind of resolved it for myself. But uh, there was a the, for the at first there was the person was unknown. It was an anonymous passerby. And then later 
this person emerged that they called CW. He was the only witness that had didn't have a name. They called him CW, and the CW stood for confidential witness. And he came forward, they say, to G. Gordon Liddy, who was a radio host at the time. And then uh, he he uh, he did some FBI. He was interviewed by the FBI and so on. But everybody they always concealed his name. But uh, eventually, it, it sort of seeped out that his name was Dale Kyle. And everybody then everybody knew his name was Dale Kyle. Well, they, actually, that wasn't his name either, because I I went to the archives uh, later and found more documents. His full name was Kermit Dale Kyle, and he's he's uh, deceased now. But he is the person that they say found the body, but then he didn't call it in. They say he went up to Turkey Run, which was a park maintenance facility up the road, and told two park maintenance workers about it. And then uh, they supposedly called it in. But that story doesn't ring true. Uh, his story and the park maintenance worker's story about how they, there was one of them was black and one of them was white. And his story is that he told the one gentleman and not the other and their story is he told the other gentleman and not this one and and then you know one story is they were sitting down when he told him another story is they were walking in a parking lot and that th there were two phones at this place and the whole his the whole story of him telling these park maintenance workers about the the body is it doesn't ring true at all but there was a story in the uh new york post by a, a journalist named mike mccallery who did the cop beat in New York, and he, he did police reporting. And he had a story in, I think, March of 1994 called Case Closed. And it, it's a very interesting story because I think he let the cat out of the bag in that one. He says that the park maintenance workers were at the park having a midday drink, <laughs> and uh, they found the body. Of course, they were compromised because they, uh, they could be fired or lose their pension if they were drinking on the job. So they came, they went along with this other story about this guy, Dale Kyle. But I, I really believe that the park maintenance workers, in, in my mind anyway, they were the ones that discovered the body and they were never interviewed about what they saw because what they saw was not something that we were supposed to know about. But they, they I think, believe that those men were there and they, they were drinking beer and they were at the park. Gotcha, and what were the things that the public wasn't supposed to know about? Well, whatever they saw, we don't know what they saw. Oh, okay, gotcha. See, that's the that's the, that's why I think that they're they were never interviewed about what they saw. But you know, when they when they called in the the call for the dead body at the park, they also said that there was a car accident, and the car accident was down by Fort Marcy Park, right out across the street from the park. So, if they knew about the car accident, how did they find out about that? Officially, this guy Dale Kyle didn't tell them anything about a car accident. But they knew about it. It's in the 911 call. So how do, they had to be down there to know about the car accident. That just shows you that they were there. And, so, yeah, so they, he, sorry, please continue. It, well, that's, that's just, that's, 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 a, you know, that, this was something that puzzled me for years about who found the body. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those two part maintenance workers, they were Chuck Stowe and, and uh, the other guy's name was Swan, Swan and Stowe. And they, I believe they found the body, but that's not official. They didn't officially find the body. Officially, it was Dale Kyle. Gotcha. That's the official story. And so he had left sometime, left for lunch at 1 p.m. from like one of the White House uh, adjunct buildings or one of the, these buildings where the attorneys for the White House were had their offices. And they're assuming that he died sometime an hour or two later based upon the autopsy. Uh, four o'clock, I'd say. He died around four. So the, the three, autopsy, yeah. In the, so in he's the missing. For, the body. Yeah, he's missing for three hours, right? Right. And there's no, you know, with all the security cameras everywhere, they we're supposed to believe that the, the White House didn't have a camera of him leaving the compound. And, he, and he, his car wasn't parked there that day, so he, he didn't leave in his car. In fact, the, the car that they say was his car at the park was actually his kid's car. He, he had three adult children, and they, they shared a... Honda, it was a 1984, or not, I'm sorry, 1989 silver gray Honda, and that car was not at the park, and witnesses didn't see that car at the park, so, and that was, that was a key part of the case, but Martin, if I get back to Dave for a minute, he, sure. you know, he, like myself, was very interested in, in the first reporting of the case, more than I was, I mean, I got interested because I wanted, I was curious about who found the body, but Dave Martin 
right away from the very beginning keyed in on the press and what they were reporting. And I didn't do that because it, I didn't really wander into that park till a year later. But by that time, David Martin, who ended up on that panel where I, I heard him in 94, he had uh, been investigating more before anyone else. And he's the author of this book we're talking about, The Murder of Vince Foster. Now, what Martin did on the in the beginning, you see, he went, I should tell you, he went to college with Vince Foster right. at Davidson. So he knew the victim. And, right, and there, tried, just to interject, sorry, but he's featured uh, Vince Foster and Dave Martin are featured together in the book in a picture or their, uh, you know, one of their yearbooks at Davidson. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they were both in the Young Democrat Club and Martin was the secretary of the club. And he so see, he, and he played intramural basketball with the man. He, I mean, he knew the guy and he just to him, it was shocking that they said he committed suicide. He said he just didn't believe it out of the gate. So he was very carefully reading the newspaper art reports. And one of the first reports in the Washington Post, I think it was by Michael Isikoff, it said that the police were unable to interview the Foster family on the night of the death because they were too distraught. So they turned the police away. Now, when there's a, a death like this, it's customary for the police to go to the family to make notification and tell them that their loved one had died. And at that time, the police are supposed to interview the family because this is, you know, they want to get some initial early, you know, firsthand information about, you know, their thoughts on this and, and you know, right. what's going on. So when Dave read the article, it said the police were turned away. He couldn't believe that. He thought, you know, how can you turn the police away when they're on a death investigation? He just, he said, you think the family would want to talk to the police to find out what happened. I mean, right. it just, it didn't ring true to him. So, he called the park police. So he did his own investigation right off the bat. He calls the park police and he asks a, a higher up uh, officer, you know, Major Hines, I think it was. He said, what, what is this in the paper about police being turned away? He said, that can't be true, is it? And the man lied to Martin. He said, well, actually, the police interviewed the family the next morning. Well, that really wasn't true either. And uh, but we didn't know it at the time. In fact, it would be a year later when the Senate held some hearings and these park police officers were invited to testify, that they they were uh, testifying live on C-SPAN, you know, and, and they said that they interviewed the family for an hour and 10 minutes. They were in the house. And uh, David Gergen was there, and he's the he was the White House spokesperson who, who said that the police were turned away. Now, he, he knew that wasn't true. And another Post reporter, Walter Pincus, who covers the CIA, or he's the CIA guy, the reports for the post, but he, Walter Pincus was in the house too. And so you got a post reporter that's there. And the next day the, the post is reporting that the police were not allowed in the house. Well, there's something wrong right off the bat. Right. And David Martin keyed in on that right away, right away. And what's important about this and why they didn't tell us what the fa what the family told the police is they told the police they didn't think he committed suicide. That was the initial reaction from the family. Right. And yeah. even Clinton, Bill Clinton was there at 11 p.m. Well, Clinton was there, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was something going on at the family house and the stories right. were already suspicious right from the get go. Right. But the, the people at the house, including Bill Clinton, I don't think anybody really knew what had happened at that point. But they didn't think it was suicide. In fact, Webster Hubble told someone uh, that night, he called someone on the phone in Arkansas and said, don't believe it's a suicide. Don't believe it. And then, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton didn't believe he committed suicide, and and uh, that was her first reaction. And and the Foster family said that he wasn't depressed and so on. And Martin, Dave, Martin, the author of this book, he he picked this up right away. He picked up on this fact uh, because uh, Foster's brother-in-law said there was not a damn thing to the stories of him being depressed. But in a, just a few days after the death this depression story emerged in the press that Foster had been depressed for a long time. And he, and the family started, his sister, Vince's sister started to say that he'd been depressed and the depression story emerged. But Dave Martin, I think uh, to his credit, more than anybody else was on the press right out of the gate. And he, he followed the press accounts of uh, Foster's death. And it's throughout this book is uh, the role of the press in the cover up. 
And that is uh, really it's what made the whole cover up successful, the role of the press. The press is the the, the, the one organization that made it all uh, successful, the cover up. Yeah. And there's so many like uh, malefactors, so many bad actors. Uh, you mentioned Isakoff, but the list is very, very long of people who either were ignorant of it. I mean, I think Dave is famous for writing this this one uh, article that was the 17 techniques for truth suppression. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because he wrote it in the context of uh, the Vince Foster case, but it also got kind of bandied around the internet, the early internet, and, and people applied it to all kinds of other stuff. But I right. yeah. highly recommend people take a look at the 17 techniques. So oh, yeah. they're great. Well, we, we met, a, we, I got Dave on the internet. You know, when we first met, he sent me a fax the next day because in those days we were still sending faxes and I had gotten online. I think I had AOL or something. And I, I told him, I said, you got to get on the internet, Gary. I said, Dave, I said, you get all the stuff that, you know, there's people on the internet talking about Foster. You need to join the discussion. So I, right. I told him to get on online. But we started uh, about the time that the internet was becoming popular. And that was kind of what I read too, because Dave mentions in the book uh, Michael Rivera, Rancho Ramucca. That's really where I followed the Foster case. And Dan DC Dave was posted, I believe, on what really happened, or he was posted on some of the early websites. Maybe it was Rents or something, where you could read his dispatches about the foster case right well we had a we joined a group called the cs list that called clinton scandals and i somebody approached me on the internet because i was posting things that i was discovering about the case and, and, and you know things that were inconsistent and didn't make sense and and this some of these anomalies of the case and a guy contacted me and said oh you know you ought to join our little group so I joined this group, the CS list stood for Clinton scandals list. And there was a group of people talking about the foster case. So I jumped in there and I thought these were all like-minded individuals. So I told Martin, you got to get on the internet and join this group with me. See? So the funny thing is he comes in the group and the first thing he does is start to point the finger at the press and that, uh, that the press has a role in the cover up, And, in short order, he and I were both kicked out of the CS list. They, they accused us of press bashing and ad hominem attacks. And we really didn't, weren't guilty of any ad hominem attacks, but we were guilty of press bashing because we were pointing the finger at the role of the press and the cover-up, and that was taboo. So they, they gave us a thing they, they called the digest, where we could read the posts of the other people, their comments, but we were not allowed to say anything unless it was approved by their moderator. So this was our first experience with, with uh, censorship. And from there, we joined another group called uh, Free Republic, which is still up. It's pretty popular, I think. Yes. Yeah. And we both got kicked out of there, too. <laughs> <laughs> again, we're not supposed to criticize the press. And, and we didn't, you know, it was okay to criticize like the liberal media or something, but you can't criticize the entire press, the, the conservative media and the liberal media, and say, hey, look, they're all covering up something very significant here. And that's what Martin was, was doing very early on. And he, he opened my eyes when we got kicked out of those groups. Then I, I realized, you know, he was really, uh, uh, very perceptive and, and, and ahead of everybody. Uh, and another, he has some, this guy, the author of this book has some great qualities. There's a, uh, as, as an individual that, that makes his writing so good is that he is what I think is, is, uh, several of the characteristics of prudence. I don't know all eight of them, but I remember Thomas Aquinas wrote that there were eight parts of prudence. If you're a prudent individual, it's a virtue. And Martin, is it's right thinking is what it is. And he, he's a good thinker because two of the parts or three of the parts of prudence are memory, remembering the past. And, and, and Dave Martin has a good knowledge of our history in the past, particularly he's, he's a scholar of the Kennedy assassination. And he reads a lot of books. I think he reads a book a week at least, but he, he has a lot of background information. And then he's, he's, he's very circumspect. He looks at the, the whole picture. He steps back. And the third thing, which is a part of prudence that he has, is caution. He never overstates things. This is something I'm guilty of. I, I go too far. But he doesn't state things that he doesn't have evidence for. 
So he's very cautious in his writing and he doesn't go off on a, you know, wild with wild ideas. It's, it's all well researched and documented and very solid. And, and I think he, that makes him a very prudent man. And because someone asked me a question one time about this book, um, when I told my neighbor about it, they said, well, well, how do you know you can trust this guy? And I said, well, because he, first of all, he's very high integrity. He's very honest and he loves honesty and the truth. And then he's very prudent. So uh, he's he's a guy you can count on, I think. For- well, I think that he successfully lays out and identifies each one of these writers or institutions that twisted the facts around the death of Vince Foster. So he, he lays out Isakoff. I mean, the names go on and on, but there's so there's just so many problems. And, and, and you know, he, he has almost like two pages of all kinds of questions that a lot of people didn't ask. But there were definitely uh, seemed like operators, Walter Pincus, Blumenthal, names that have popped up again recently. Isakoff, who was all on board for the, the Russia hoax against Trump. But uh, there were actually, there was a foreign writer who I used to read too, Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Can you talk a little bit about him and meeting him and what his kind of take was? Oh, sure. Well, I, I met Ambrose at the, uh, at the uh, forum where I met Martin. There was, he was there the same day. They were both on the dais together. And he and I, I, I went to his house a couple times for dinner. I became a friend of his and, and sort of a source for him. And because and, I would, when I would find information and documents i shared my documents that i would find i was, I was kind of a that was my role in this thing was really being a document digger but i would give the documents to uh martin i give them to, to ambrose and i gave them to uh, uh patrick knowlton and john clark patrick was a witness in the case and i also shared them with christopher ruddy who was actually turned out to be a villain in the case but he was a, early on he was I, I we all thought he was one of the truth seekers but that's how I met Ambrose. And Ambrose did something very significant, I think. If I had to name one thing that he did that was really important, there was this this witness I mentioned, Patrick Knowlton. And he's a key witness in the case because he he wandered into the park. He had to take a leak. He's going out the parkway. And he, he stops in there briefly. And uh, he sees the parking lot. And he, he sees what's there. And one thing that's not there is Vince Foster's car. He doesn't realize it at the time. He sees two other vehicles, but this man has the most unusual memory. He remembers everything in great detail, and you cannot shake him. And he also is a very strong character for honesty. And the authorities tried to get him to change his story about what he saw at the park. They wanted him to say that he saw this uh, car that matched the description of of the one that the foster children drove, this gray Honda. But he wouldn't do it. And they interviewed him twice, uh, and and they tried to twist him around, but he, he just wouldn't budge. So then uh, they just falsified his report. The FBI agents just just out and out lied and, and made the report false. For, and this, they can do this. See, when they interview people, the FBI doesn't tape record it or videotape or anything. They take notes, and then they transcribe it into a typewritten form which is called a 302. It's an interview. 302, right. Well, yeah, right. We know all about those recent uh, you know, things involving stroke or whatever, the yeah. discrepancies in the 302 recently. Sorry. Right. Well, you can't, you can't, the witnesses don't get to look at their 302s and sign off on them. They're just, the FBI does the 302. They create it, they type it, and that's it. Well, Knowlton's 302 was falsified by these authorities. And Ambrose, the journalist from England here, He was going around trying to find the witnesses and cross check with them about their 302s and see if they were accurate. So he's doing some real gumshoe work. But what's interesting is that Knowlton's name was misspelled by the park police. They spelled it is N-O-L-T-O-N, but it's actually spelled K-N-O-W-L-T-O-N. So at one point, even the FBI couldn't find Knowlton because they didn't know how to spell his name. But in the... uh, in the Park Police report, they said he was driving out to Atlin, Virginia. It's a very small town. So Ambrose drives out to this little community, and he snoops around. He goes into the little community stores and stuff and says, do you know Knowlton? Does anybody here know Knowlton? <laughs> they said, sure, he lives over there. So he, he found him, see? But that took some digging because his name had been misspelled. Right. Do you but, believe intentionally? 
Oh, of course. This yeah. is a tech. This is one of the techniques of, of uh, truth suppression is to misspell key, especially key witnesses. You misspell their names and no one can find them. And it's it's just Ambrose was a you know he's a he's a he's a digger you know he figured well the guy's going to Adlin his name is Knowlton maybe it's phonetically correct and he was right about that it was misspelled but it was phonetically correct so he shows Knowlton his 302 report which had become come public now because of some Senate hearings that got thrown into a bunch of documents and he found it there so he shows it to Knowlton says is this what you told the FBI Knowlton says no that's not what I told you. this is all lies. And then from there, uh, what happened next was Knowlton got subpoenaed to testify before the Whitewater Grand Jury. He was harassed and intimidated on the streets of Washington. Uh, he got a, he had a neighbor who's an attorney, John Clark, who came to his aid. And the two of them uh, decided that you know, they're going to fight this grand jury witness intimidation. And they didn't uh, win their lawsuit for that, but they did succeed in uh, getting 20 pages attached to the official report on Foster's death. It's called the, the right. appendix to the report. It's in the report. It's, it's, it's part of the report. And it's they part got of the Star the, Report, right? Part, pardon me? Part of the Star Report. Well, they call it the Star Report, but it's actually, it actually was written by Brett Kavanaugh. Right, okay. The whole thing was written by Kavanaugh. But it's, it's technically the, the proper name for it is the report on the death of uh, Deputy White House Counsel Vincent Foster. And... The report on the death of Vincent Foster has an appendix. That's volume two. And it's part of part of and included in the report. And see, this is all because of Ambrose. Because your question was, what, what can I tell you about Ambrose? Well, Ambrose found Knowlton and Knowlton, he brought him forward. And then Knowlton and his attorney end up attaching evidence of a cover up to the official report. So Ambrose had a big role, a really big role. Right. And Knowlton, Knowlton, they like somebody, either the FBI or some government agency, really put the harassment on Knowlton, following oh, yeah. him around. Oh, yeah. They, they, guys they, who, yeah, guys they who were like... They break him. Yeah. You know, uh, Patrick has a book uh, that he wrote, if I can just mention it. It's called As If It Never Happened. It's a, it's a story about his childhood. And he had a very difficult childhood and it's a it's a great book it's just a, it's a, it's a page turner martin did a review of it you could probably find martin's review of it online if you look up david martin and patrick knowlton as if it never happened and that book i mean you you see the childhood of patrick knowlton and you and you realize why the fbi couldn't break this guy he had a backbone i mean and he he was a very courageous man and a man committed to the truth and, yeah, and the sad truth is that in other big investigations, it wouldn't be the first time the FBI shaped uh, testimony or tried to either omit or include. Like if you look at the Bobby Kennedy assassination, all these other things, there's a lot of times these 302s or the actual witnesses that get tried to get intimidated. There's a lot of intimidation. And yeah, for no, yeah, for no they used to they, get away with it. Now, yeah. the, I should add one more thing that, that, that makes because people are probably wondering if anybody's listening to this. They're thinking, well, how come we don't know about this? You know, I never heard of this stuff. Well, see, the 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 appendix to the official report, it was it should have been news. I mean, this is the first time in the history of our country that an independent counsel had evidence of a cover up, evidence of a cover up by his own staff, included in his report. And what happened was the press just didn't report it. Nobody has ever reported that there's an appendix to the official report of the death of Vincent Foster. Very true. Uh, and, only and the alternate has, media. Only the alternate media reported on that. Yeah. If well, at all. I can't even think of anybody in the alternate media. I thought that, that I thought that Rivero talked about it. Oh, Rivero. Yeah. Well, Rivero has it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's it's pretty it's pretty scarce. Yes. And it's it's uh, because it's not reported. It's it's um, it's like it's it's not known. It, it didn't happen. It never if it's not reported, it doesn't happen. And John Clark, Patrick's attorney, had a term for what he called saturation for something to to be known. It needs to be reported over and over and over uh, just endlessly to drive the point home. And that's why everybody's wearing face masks today, because they drive that point home. But but, you know, this is they just uh, they pound on it and pound on it. But this this appendix was never mentioned. So it right. But it's very right. important because it came out of the three judge district court in D.C., the kind of, you know, springboard into the Supreme Court that actually hired Ken Starr. So it was a very August body that included that. 
uh, oh, yeah. addendum from Clark and, and Knowlton. So very, very important material. Yeah. But I think it's fascinating that, Star, can you talk a little bit what you know about uh, Michael Rodriguez and Kavanaugh who worked under Star? Oh, sure. Well, these, there's so many big players. All of this information is in this book. Yeah. Uh, of course, everything we're talking about is in here, and, and, and Gary spells it all out. Uh, Martin has a – he even mentions – see, he quotes these three judges because we found the documents where the three judges deliberated amongst themselves. They, they faxed and emailed each other about whether they should attach Knowlton's appendix or not. And Judge Butzner said we need to include it or we could be charged as conspirators in the cover-up. And, and Martin talks about all of this in his book. And he, go, he goes into great detail on, on Miguel Rodriguez, who is a, a very important person. He was the lead investigator into Foster's death. And uh, he was uh, part of Starr's team, but he was, he was actually trying to find the truth. He thought that Foster was murdered. And uh, there's a memorandum that he wrote. It's a 30-page memorandum, and it's in the appendix of uh, Gary um, uh, David Martin's book, The Murder of Vince Foster. And in that memorandum, he states, and, and they had this meeting. I should tell you, Brett Kavanaugh was in the meeting. There were about four or five people at the meeting, and Rodriguez was in charge of the meeting. But it states in the memorandum of the meeting that the park police brought uh, the gun to the park and placed it in Foster's hand. And they'd also moved the body. They dragged the body up off this berm onto level ground and repositioned it. At first, the first witnesses that saw the body, there was hardly any blood. And what they did see was very dried and black. But once they moved it up onto the level ground, the blood flowed. And now there's red blood and uh, it's flowing and there's a gun in the hand. And the police brought the gun and put it in the hand, and then they re-photographed the body. And, of course, the later witnesses that come, like the, the paramedics or, or ambulance workers that come to, to pick up the body to take it away, they see all this red blood. They see more blood than the first witnesses. But that's because the body was moved. Now, Rodriguez knew that these park police brought the gun and, and staged the crime scene and re-photographed it, and that's why some of the early photographs disappeared. Well... Rodriguez was not doing the job they hired him for. He was supposed to cover up the murder, and he's now trying to solve the crime. So they forced him out. And uh, he, his resignation letter is also in Martin's book. It's in the back. Right. And you were the one who dug that out of the National Archives, right? I, I did with Patrick Knowlton. Patrick Knowlton and I would go to the archives together frequently. After, the, after everything was shut down in the independent counsel's office, those documents were turned over to the archives and we would go up there in 2005, 2007, 2009, and we would get boxes of documents and go through pages of many things we'd already seen before, but every once in a while you find something significant. And we found re the re resignation letter of Rodriguez where he talked about the FBI falsifying statements and so on. And he didn't but want to be part of it, so he resigned. Now, the, the guy that took his place was Brett Kavanaugh, who, who went on to the Supreme Court. And he also wrote the cover-up report that covered up the murder. Yeah, and he also did all of the footnotes to the Star Report, all the juicy, very, uh, li you know, livid details about Bill Clinton's sex life. He included that in there. Well, that's it, different. That's a different yeah, it is different. But it's it not the same. Show. That's the that's the Lewinsky report. Right. That's but, Lewinsky. This is he did the he wrote the I don't know what he did with the Lewinsky report. I didn't really follow that story, but. He did write the report on the death of Vincent Foster. Gotcha. And it, had, it has about 300 footnotes, and most of them are secret because they, they did a lot of stuff in the grand jury, which is secret. You can't see it. You can't, you can't see the evidence. They got secret evidence. Wow. Wow. And, and these were some of the parallels that Martin drew between Foster and, and Alfred Dreyfus. He, he compares this story of Foster to a French soldier, an officer who was falsely accused of treason. And uh, there, were, there was a, a lot of secret evidence in that case as well. And uh, Martin calls the book America's would-be Dreyfus Affair because Alfred Dreyfus was eventually acquitted, but uh, Foster is still guilty of self-murder. So he, he, he didn't get acquitted. I think, can I just read you a short, just a short passage here? Please do, please do. This, yeah. this is a comparison he made between the, 
the Dreyfus case and 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 uh, Foster. He he said, and this is on page one sixty eight. Is the French newspaper? I don't know. If my French isn't that good, but it's La Autorite, uh put it in the earlier case. Quote: If Dreyfus is not guilty, then the government is. End quote. So then Martin writes: If Vince Foster is not guilty of self murder, then not only are our government leaders protecting those who are guilty of the assassination, but so too are the controllers of our major news organs. This is a very unsettling thought, and it should make all of us rather insecure, suggesting that we don't have the government of laws that we thought we did, nor a free press as we thought was guaranteed by the First Amendment. And that really, that is the message of this book, really. It's it's, it's mentioned throughout, and it's, it's in a poem that he puts at the end, but it really, this case is important because it tells us that we don't have institutions, the Justice Department, the Congress, uh, the courts. I mean, they, they don't they don't protect us and we don't have a free press that provides scrutiny of our government. They, they, it's, it's we're, we're uh, bordering on tyranny if we're not already there. And yeah, that's and it's interesting. The, the two characters. Right, and the two characters who kind of went against the grain or went against the government's position, Knowlton and Rodriguez, both got persecuted, right? So Rodriguez, like, literally said, uh, I've been told to back down, and right. it has my career and reputation at stake and my personal health and family. Like, those yeah, are he was, yeah, they terrorized him. But see, that there, there are people that, that suffered that didn't win. And Martin, in his book, compares them to the people that supported Alfred Dreyfus and his freedom to get him out of prison. Now, I think Knowlton and Clark and, uh, you know, of course, Gary Martin, the, these are the people that are fighting for justice, and they're sort of beaten down. And then there's the people that, that participated in the cover-up who, who rise up, and, and that would include uh, Brett Kavanaugh, who went on to the Supreme Court, and another person who's throughout the book, I have to mention Christopher Ruddy, because he is, uh, com he's compared early on, uh, Martin compares him to a guy named Bernard Lazar, who was a, a French journalist that took up the case of Dreyfus and, uh, and fought for his innocence. But then he thought, we, early on, we thought Ruddy was Bernard Lazar, but he turned out not to be. He turned out to be, uh, someone who was really secretly working for the other side. And now today, uh, you know, it, Ruddy is a friend of the Clintons. Uh, he's an advisor and friend of Donald Trump. Right. And uh, he recommended Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court to Trump. And he right. appears regularly on television programs like uh, George Stephanopoulos will have him on his Sunday morning show. He's one of the prominent uh, talking heads and journalist experts. He's the CEO of a company called Newsmax, and he's worth millions and millions of dollars. Now, back in the day when he was our, what we thought was our friend, he, uh, he used to come and stay at my house. When he was in Washington, I used to pick him up at the airport, and he slept at my house and ate at my table. I, I mean, I, I thought he was a great guy, but, you know, at some point he told me to, that John Clark was not to be trusted, that I should stay away from Clark and Knowlton. And at that point, I realized he wasn't a good guy. And I, it's, I, I, it, I, I started to think about the things that he was doing in, in covering up for the FBI. And, and I, I realized that he was not really on our side. But Martin has this great sentence describing Ruddy, who at, at one point was called a conspiracy theorist by the press because he was digging into the case or so we thought. And then he, he metamorphosized like a caterpillar, you know, into this respectable journalist. So here's, here's what Martin wrote. I really like it. He said, from the perspective of America's mainstream press, the ugly caterpillar of a conspiracy theorist, Ruddy, had wondrously metamorphosized, in contrast to his actual appearance, into the respectable and influential butterfly of a much respected CEO. And, and that's it. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's gone up like Brett Kavanaugh. Those guys rise to the top.
Right, and they were young at that time, like late 20s, so it's almost 29. like... 29, both of yeah. them were 29. Right, so it's almost like my perception of them is that's kind of how they earned their bones in some ways. Is through, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's... They earned their bones in the system, and a lot of these guys, too. A lot of these names that popped up pop up later in other nefarious uh, situations. Blumenthal... Now, Alex Azar is one of them. Do you know, he's the head of Health and Human Services. All right, Azar. Alex Azar was part of Star's team with Kavanaugh. And he's he's in the back. See, Martin's book brings it right up to date because there was a, another uh, murder in Washington that was very bizarre. Uh, it was a gentleman named uh, uh, Daniel Best was his name. And, and he uh, worked for Health and Human Services. And he was in charge of lowering drug prices. This is and very he, recent, right? Very recent. 2017, I think. He was he was found uh, dead in a parking lot, uh, and he died of blunt force trauma, and they called it a suicide, like he beat himself to death. Yeah, I mean, and, the scary that chapter is chapter yeah. nineteen of the book. It's the last chapter. It's a postscript called Trump's Vince Foster question mark, and Alex Azar is head of Health and Human Services. But yeah, it comes full circle. I mean, this what's in this book? It might seem like an event from. 1993, but it's it's going on right now. It's very current. It really is. It really is current because Trump himself mentioned in an interview, talked about uh, Vince Foster and how suspicious his death was. So <laughs> Trump seems to be very aware or cognizant of the. Well, he he brought it up and dropped it as quickly as he brought it up. He, he dropped it as, and within the next sentence. He said, "But I really don't know anything about it." <laughs> right. That's just. And he was, and he the quote that he said it was fishy. He was an interview he gave the Washington Post, which, you know, is supposed to be fake news. But why is he giving an interview to the Washington Post, which covers up the murder of Foster and promotes Brett Kavanaugh and, and Ruddy? And, uh, you know, the, the like a few days after Trump said that, Sheila Anthony, Foster's sister, wrote an opinion piece, uh, sort of a how dare you talk about my poor brother who committed suicide. So it, Trump, in some ways, is like a professional wrestler. You know, he positions himself in the ring so the other wrestler can take him down. Interesting. What do you think the real reason for Vince Foster's murder was? Why do you think that he was? Uh, <laughs> do you uh, have any question. opinions? That's, that's the eternal question. Right. Uh, I have to go back to Aristotle. who uh, I studied philosophy in college, but Aristotle said, you know, you can know that something is without knowing why it is or how it is. And he used an, the eclipse as an example. You can see an eclipse of the moon and you can you can know that it is. But people don't always know why it is. Right. And I I don't really know why Vince Foster was murdered. We know that he was murdered. That's beyond any doubt. We've proven that. But there are a variety of reasons that are out there. And uh Martin has a chapter on that, which, which he puts out several possibilities, but he doesn't actually say it was one or the other. But it, these are possibilities. The, uh, the chapter is titled, Was Vince Foster's Murder Pizzagate Related? Right. I mean, some uh, other names popped into this book that I was uh, surprised uh, to see. I don't remember Jim Clemente uh, being. Oh, yeah. Clemente was. He was uh, he was one of the FBI agents signed the case. Now, what's, and this is where we're talking about pizza get related. See, Clemente was a uh, expert in uh, child uh, abduction and, and uh, child abuse. OK, that's his specialty. He's an FBI profiler and uh, he has appeared on RT television uh, talking about his expertise is in uh, with pedophilia. Now. This is the strangest thing of all the documents I found. Patrick and I found a document at the National Archives. It was a cover sheet. There was nothing behind it. There were no other pages. It was just in a box of, of documents from the Office of Independent Counsel. And on this piece of paper, it has the FBI logo in the middle. And the title of the, the document is Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit. And below that, it says Questions for a Suicide Expert Vincent Foster Death Investigation. And it was prepared by an FBI supervisory agent, but the name is redacted. So we don't know who, who drafted this document. 
We don't know what's inside the document because none of the document exists. We only have the cover sheet. But you have to wonder, why is there a document concerning Vincent Foster's death titled Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit? I mean, what is that doing in there? I mean, it just seems so out of place. It's very strange. But it's also like you bring up uh, David Brock, who wrote about Foster. Uh -huh. And then he was the former boyfriend of James Elephantis and Media Matters. So that's comic ping pong. So there's all kind. Of, he called Brock called Knowlton the self discrediting witness, whatever that means. I don't know how he discredited himself because uh, he's only said one thing over and over again. Right. But uh, there's also some other interesting facts about like Robert Maxwell pops up in the book, too, which is. Yeah, there was a Jim Norman. I had uh, Patrick and I had uh, had lunch with him in New York a couple of years back, and he he was a senior editor at Forbes, and he wrote an article about uh, Foster's murder being tied to espionage. And it was it was uh, killed by the uh, Forbes magazine. They wouldn't publish it. So it, got, it did get published in a uh, kind of off-the-wall publication called uh, Media Bypass. And I have a copy of that thing. I don't know if I, if I put that up at our website or not, but uh, Norman had a lot of information on that that there was this uh, some type of banking software that had a back door where you know you could get in and 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 it was I think the software was sold to promise, a lot of countries. Promise software. Yeah, promise software, and that's tied to uh, some espionage stuff. And Webster, Hubble, Hillary Clinton, and Vince Foster were tied to that, and there were their names appeared on documents with Maxwell's name, and uh, Maxwell's daughter was Ghislaine Maxwell, who is the sexual child procurer for Jeffrey Epstein. So you're back to that again. Right. It's just a and very I don't, I don't have any evidence that any of this is tied to the murder of Vincent Foster, but it does sort of swirl around, you know. But he was tied up with all kinds of crazy stuff. His last weekend he was with Webb Hubble and a guy with ties to the mafia. Yeah. He was tied up with the Clintons who all kinds of shenanigans went on in Arkansas. He was the person overseeing their blind trust and had a lot of whitewater information. Which yeah, I don't think, uh, some people ask me oftentimes, they say, well, did, do you think he knew too much? And I don't think you, I don't think that's the answer because if even if you know too much, like Patrick Knowlton, you could say knows too much. I mean, who do you tell? Are you going to call the Washington Post, the New York Times? I mean, they're not going to report anything. So there's really nobody to tell. So I don't think he knew too much. It's more likely that he, he crossed somebody up or or he didn't want to go along with something, uh, you know, participate in some type of activity. Maybe he had a, drew the line, uh, but he, you know, he hung around with some, uh, you know, gangster type people, frankly. And, you know, if you hang around, gangsters kill gangsters. I mean, that's just the way the world is. So, you know, that's not unusual. But what, what I think it's difficult for this case to come out is that, if they tell us he was murdered, everybody in the in the world is going to want to know why, and and the big why is something very dark, and and that's what we're not supposed to know. So we we can't. They won't tell us he was murdered because then they might have to tell us why he was murdered, and the why he was murdered is something probably very very dark. Yeah, and that's a great way to end it. I mean, he was the second. He was the person after JFK with the highest level of government who was found dead. Right. So yeah. it was like. Uh, the we have a couple minutes. Left. Yeah, go ahead. I want to because if I if you're getting near the end, I want to read the final poem in uh, David Martin's book because it is do. it do. does end on something dark, uh, and it's it's a uh, it's I think it, I think it's he says things so well. He has poems throughout the book, and he's so good at it because it really captures the essence of things. It's this one was he wrote 20 years ago. It's called American Gothic. We all like to hear scary stories. I will tell you one that will thrill you. If they thought it was in their interests, our government thugs would kill you. They might use a popular ruse to provide enough cover to hide. They could say that you were unbalanced and fell victim to suicide. So what if there are no good answers to questions like how and why? Who in this land can we count on to send up a hue and a cry? Though the parts of the cover story can't be crafted to fall into place, our press will still spare no effort to sell us the government case. When all we can hear is one version, 
the government's truth and no more, we must wonder about all those reporters. Just who are they working for? What happened to equal protection? Who protects us from government crimes when we can't depend on the Congress or the news or the Post or the Times? The Soviet state has now fallen with its empire constructed on fear. But if we don't do something to stop it, we're well on our way to it here. And that's how it ends. Excellent. And it is dark. It's dark. It's very dark. Very dark and stuff. I mean, he's only a fear, he's, there's a lot of fear right now in, in our in our nation. There's fear. People are afraid. Yeah. So, Hugh, um, you also were the co-author with Dave, um, the martyrdom of Thomas Merton in investigation. So, you guys have also worked on another book. <laughs> yeah, the interview I did with Dave earlier was the assassination of James Forrestal. Huh? And do you have any social media or email that you'd like to share if people want to reach out to you? Well, you can get me, there's two websites. Uh, one is on the Foster case, which has a, a page where you can click and send an email. That page is called FBICoverup.com. And there's a hyphen between the word cover and up. So it's cover-up.com. And the, that's the Foster page, which is extensive. And then we have a, a book uh, for the other book. It's the, it's the title of the book. It's a kind of a long address for a website, but it's the martyrdom of Thomas Merton dot com. Gotcha. And there's a contact information there. And gotcha. uh, Martin's responsible for that book too, because he, he bugged me for years. He'd say, Turley, you got to get the documents on Merton. You got to dig into that. You know, and he sent me out to do the research. But when I, I, I started, tried to write the book, I said, I need some help with this. Cause it, he's Martin is a very good writer. And he like is I an said, excellent writer. Cautious. Very prolific, too. Prolific. Yeah, he's very writer. cautious. And I, I, I tend to overstate things. So I wrote the the first draft, maybe, but he helped me polish it up. So I made him put his name on the book because I, I thought he helped a lot. And he gotcha. did. But and it was the, his uh, idea. Yeah. Right. The, the FBI cover-up page has the appendix or the addendum, the Clark Knowlton addendum. Yes, it has everything. So Lots of pictures. Yeah, everything, that, everything is there. That's... That's and, and there's even a link to Dave's book on the homepage, The Murder of Vince Foster. And again, the name is Hugh Turley talking about the book, The Murder of Vince Foster, America's Would-Be Dreyfus Affair, available now. Thank you so much, Hugh.